Namaste and good afternoon. We are in the 14th session of South Asian Online Literary Conference. Uh, in this session, we have Mr. Suresh K. Goyalji, former DG, ICCR India, uh, to chair this session. And uh, the writer participants are Ms. Zuarija Mou from Bangladesh, uh, Dr. Mahesh Paudyal from Nepal, Captain Elmo Jayawardhana from Sri Lanka. And uh, I think uh, Ms. Aishat Hussain Manik is yet to join. She will join us soon. And uh, Ajit Kaur, ma'am, is also with us. Hearty welcome, ma'am. So to begin with, uh, I request uh, Zuharija, ma'am, to make her presentation. Before that, I request her also to briefly introduce herself. Ma'am, you will need to unmute first. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Ajit ji. Namaste, Ajit, ma'am. Namaste, Ajit, ma'am. So nice to see you, healthy and cheerful. Hello, I am from Sri Lanka. Yeah, yeah. Just a minute, sir. Madam Zuharija will make a presentation. Ma'am, please. Thank you. Good afternoon from Bangladesh. I would like to introduce myself as a writer and filmmaker from Bangladesh. I like to write my thoughts as a writer and portray them as a filmmaker. I am the owner and the founder of Tonko Talkies Film Production and Distribution Studio. Because of COVID-19 pandemic, the SARC Literary Conference is happening virtually, but I'm glad that to see these known faces and want to convey my gratitude to us, Ojitma and the full team of South Asian Online Literary Conference. Last year has been very difficult for us. Still, we are trying to recover, waiting for the world to heal. During this time, our creations, our poetry, stories, films has reflected the internal and external chaos we are facing. Today, I will recite some parts of my fiction in white polythene in the time of Corona. This was written at the end of December 2020 when our lives were uncertain and anxious. So I'm starting now. In white polythene, in the time of Corona, a part of the fiction is Devil of Mount, Softer Ali, went to the tea stall near the mound to have a cup of tea, floating with splitting milk. No sooner had he taken a seat than someone blurted out from nowhere. My goodness, have you just come from a burial of corona patient? As soon as the words were finished, a plethora of raised voices crushed into the tea stall. The crowd formed an alliance and lifted Sofder Ali over their heads and carried him somewhere along the road. They dropped him beside the road after passing the top of the mound where two or three men covered with white polythene just buried a dead. The crowd was beginning to get bigger as they started walking and it became huge when they stopped. 
fallen over by the road, helpless of the rally, wanted to say once or twice, I didn't touch the dead body. Standing in the middle of the crowd, a man with black sunglasses, red t-shirt and blue jeans said in a serious tone, go home and take a bath with Savlon. Following Chan using petiole of bitter leaf, another man said, Savlon is no good. Soap is the best I found on Facebook. Blue Jean sensed it's a win-win situation for him, and it was difficult for him to give up so easily in front of the crowd. He said again, after burping, the meat he ate in lunch. Do you understand WHO? WHO, World Health Organization, mentioned Savlon on their website. Facebook? After all, gives wrong information. Savdar Ali, caught between such heated argument of soap and savlon, tried to defend again. Trust me, I didn't touch the dead body. Another part of the fiction title, Man with Label. Five feet away, on the side of the road, where the blue truck was perked. Rajon Tarofdar found pupil were stumbling. It was increasingly becoming difficult to make them follow the line. While on his way, Rajon Tarofdar, wearing masks and gloves, stopped along the road, took some time to observe. A woman with her newborn gets pushed by the crowd. She has to let behind and stood far away from the crowd. If mother can't eat, newborn won't get milk. Thinking that a frustration shivers Rajon's whole body, Rajon remembers even today he can't manage ICU for a friend's father. Probably he will live two or three days more if ICU isn't managed. Rajan passes the truck, thinking all this harsh truth. On his back, there was an apple sized paper pasted, which said, Health worker, emergency service. The other part of the fiction title Processed Packet Food. Now, there are three glass houses in this city where health workers are working, wearing green uniforms in one glass house, white in another, and black in the remaining one. The black dressed are not actually health workers. They are volunteers. They don't have any relatives alive on this earth. It's now a warm, comfy afternoon in the city. The city is barren without people. It is calm and quiet. In this afternoon, soft rays of sun melt down into a lane next to Ajit's supermarket. I had a tea stall in this lane once, before the pandemic. Near this lane, the government built the glass house for the volunteers, wearing black. In the house of the greens, dead people are buried with care and with name plates. Words complete the burial ceremony without checking any papers of the people who have no witness or relics. But now, most of the people are gathering towards the black. People are killing lines of fire bodies. The black ones are processing the dead meat in a strange way to make it edible and then giving them away in packets. Even the scientists are assuring that 
then they will stop spreading if these leaves are eaten after a good wash. And this is the only way to get free food in the city. For the time being, I'm now waiting in the line, holding my three years old daughter's stiff body in my lap. Thank you very much, everybody. And I wish we all be stay safe and the world will be a peaceful place for all of us. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Joe Azaman. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> now I invite the world second writer participant, Dr. Mahesh Paudyal, he is from Nepal. Dr. Paudyal. Namaste, uh, Namaste, respected Chair, Suresh K. Boyal, sir, respected Ma'am Ajit Kaur, Captain Elmo Dayavardhana from Sri Lanka, Madam Mo from Bangladesh, and Sir Krishna Kimbahune, yourself from uh, Site Academy. I thank uh, the Ministry of Culture and Foswal for letting me in and giving this wonderful opportunity to express some of my ideas. Uh, I'm a faculty of English at the Central Department of English, Tribune University, which is the oldest university of my country, Nepal. I am also a creative writer, but people know me more as a critic and translator. This afternoon, I want to express my, my viewpoints on Jain poetry movement. Jain poetry movement, and I have titled my paper Jain poetry movement in Nepal and endeavor to resurrect a meditative art. I call it resurrection because uh, this practice of infusing meditation with poetry was largely dormant or dead in my country. In the last few decades, some endeavors by some poets have been focused on resurrecting, bringing back to life this art of Jain, this idea of Jain in poetry. So today we have something called Jain poetry movement in Nepal, and I'm trying to theorize this very point. Jain is a phonetic variant of dhyana, dhyan, or meditation. Understandably, it is rooted in ancient Hinduism, though many, many mistakenly try to locate its root in Buddhism. So dhyan is much older than the advent of Buddhism. Dhyan from which other phonetic variants of the term arrived occurs in ancient Hindu scriptures, including the Rig Veda, understood to be the oldest written book in the history of the humankind, lays an entire ground for the development of Dhyana, both at, as a treatise as well as a method. In reality, the history of Dhyana or Dhyan lies in Sanskritic tradition and this appears in the midst of history as a method of cosmic revelation on which Jain poetry rests. Dhyan is obviously equally old. It is very cosmic revelation through Dhyana, which can be approximately translated as contemplation or profound meditation where Jain poetry seeks its roots. The word Dhi, Dhi, the root from which the word Dhyana comes occurs in the Vedas, and again, it refers to the imaginative region and is a metaphor for wisdom and poetic eloquence. There also is a parallel word called Nidhi Dhyasana. Nidhi Dhyasana is a parallel word for Dhyana, which combines Dhyayi, Upasana, and Bhavana, meaning contemplation, dwelling upon, and expression of feelings, respectively. This means the entire process is encapsulated in the word dhyana, which is also called meditation. The Hindus have the oldest history of dhyana. To them, it is the way to feel the divinity that rests in every living and non-living non entity in creation. It involves containment of worldly inclination and attachments and concentration on the higher cosmic force that reveals the unity of an individual soul with the oversoul the things we call Atma and the Paramatma. These understandings predate the birth of the Buddha and are rooted in the ancient Hindu scriptures. 
it passed down to the buddhist and the jainist traditions much later it is undisputed that the buddha pioneered specialized meditative practices like the vipassana and the preksha but dhyana as a whole is rooted in the hindu tradition much later the gita dated around 4th century bce it has an entire treatise called dhyana yoga a path to the attainment of god through meditation the mahabharata as well uh, talks about dhyana and patanjali's yoga sutra which we all understand it so very well have developed the ideas of almost a full fledged method of self actualization through the dates of these two scriptures mahabharata and gita occur quite late in the historical timeline and marginally predate the time when the buddha rose to fame they however inherited the idea from the text predating them especially the vedas and the upanishads the rigveda and the upanishads can be referred to as the earliest definitional sources of dhyana manasa dhyana why praya means says which means that this mind meditate on god on being prana or the soul this ancient hindu way of meditation lies in the cosmic belief that the energy that drives the entire living and non living world is the name it is the same as the one god possesses the pind that is the atom the pind the smallest particle or the atomic constituent of the being is a part of the energy that drives the brahmanda and we have yat pinde tat brahmande the very energy that drives the atom is the same energy that also drive the brahmanda which means whichever is in the atom is also in the cosmos but this cosmos connectivity to an ordinary human becomes understandable only through dhyana or meditation there is no scientific or empirical way to show that the energy in an atom and energy in the brahmanda is the same to an ordinary person it is through meditation that one can feel it as the hindus believe dhyana encapsulates the mental process of an individual and it bridges other levels dharana dharana is a lower mental level in which an individual is regarded by personal opinions about life and the world in the upper one which is called samadhi dharana is the lower level and samadhi is the upper level of meditation which is in fact the highest order of dhyana where an individual feels liberate obliterated of all gaps between the living soul and the god dhyana therefore entails ordering of dharana by stripping it of all the worldly attachments and vices and there of honing it upward towards samadhi and all these things are the theoretical domain where jain poetry actually rest you see poetry by dint of its very nature can immediately catch it can document and project subtle revelations in verbal forms moreover the very intimate rootedness of poetry in the philosophical rubric already gives it an advantage because a reader of poetry is always already in meditative preparedness and can respond to the poet no matter how occult how deep and how how complex he or she is poets have made jain the content of their writing and my study shows jain poetry as a genre is today understood as something that came from japan korea and some other east asian countries and the sources like that but my claim is since buddhism is very much rooted in the sub himalayan uh, terrain like the northern india and nepal this is very much a domestic tradition of ours we exported it and today poets in my country are trying to resurrect this ancient art so we have a whole lot of poet a movement is taking place i can name a lot of poets krishna prashai is a foremost poet whose san sawars is already in publication in so many languages including nepali english korean sinhala bengali burmese assamese german japanese filipino hindi telugu and kannada languages his poems have been translated into all these languages and now i know because as 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 the writer of his books introduction i do have the information he is all set to launch his second collection of jain poems 
very shortly. There are other poets. I am myself trying with all humility to write some Jain poems. Beside me, there are many poets like Manasagni, Syam Rimal, Chaviraman Shilwal, Asim Sagar, Rachana Chapsu, Sarda Gimiri Vaila, Rajendra Chapagai, Anil Khatiwada, Sarad Ritu, and so many. And with your due permission, I want to read some very short pieces of Jain poems from some of the poets. Poem number one is by Krishna Prashain. A tree, a tree suck, succumbing to the blow of innumerable strikes, never knew. A tree that succumbs to innumerable strikes, it never knew. The axe felling it has a handle made from the tree's own branch. This is a Jain poem by Krishna Prasai. My own poem, without speaking a word, without speaking a word, the snow departed, having recited to me an epic from inside the grand vacuity. In reply, I had nothing but mere screams. This is my own poem published from New Delhi, Rossi's publication. The collection is Notes of Silent Times. Another poem is Conceit by Manasagni. A painter, a painter made a painting of the sun. A painter made a painting of the sun and sewing the same, he yells, the picture is prettier than the sun. Together with applause, he also received accolades and awards with the picture in one hand and the trophies in the other. He reached home at dusk, lamps were lighted as soon as the sun was off the eyes. So he claimed his picture was better than the sun. But when the sun was gone, the picture was nowhere to be seen. So a poem on conceit. One very small poem by poet Saradritu. On a rainy day, on a rainy day, an old desire slips off, wrapped in a blanket of memories. Do not drop from the eaves gutter, please. My conclusion in the last one minute, since the number of Jain poets is growing very fast, Jain poetry is becoming a fact and a movement in Nepal. There are reasons why Jain poetry becomes extremely pertinent to Nepal because poetry as of today has become centripetal all around the world with whooping and all encompassing tendencies like globalization sweeping across the world. Most, almost everything from tangible mercantile product to intangible things like art and literature have become commodities for sale. So in this context, what is local, what is innately ours and what is rooted in ourselves becomes a part of our identity. So poets in Nepal feel Jain is, was and shall be uh, a domain of our manifestation and our expression. And thank God, although very late, poets in our country are trying to create a movement called Jain Poetry Movement. And I take great pleasure in introducing this new happening in my country. And I believe we all agree with the fact that Jain, meditation, and dhyana are very much a part of our traditional domain. And thank you very much for listening to me. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Thanks a lot, Dr. Mahesh. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Now, uh, I invite uh, Captain Elmo Jayavardhanaji, the writer from Sri Lanka. So please unmute yourself. Ah. Namaste. I wish to good afternoon to all of you, the chairperson and the lady and all the others who are in the panel. And I am here to talk to you something about literature. And because I can't read properly, my eyesight is not very good. I brought my wife to do the reading for me. So please bear with me for that. She's better looking than me in any case. So it's better, I think, that she reads. Now, uh, I am a pilot, retired airline captain. And then that's my main job I did. But I wrote books and I am a journalist. But the most important thing I've done in my life is I work with the poor. My wife and I run an organization for the last 26 years. We are helping people who have the multiple burdens of poverty. That is my job now. Uh, basically, that's all I need to tell you. I'm from Sri Lanka. And now I'll tell you something about my book. The book is all Kakian. I don't know whether you can see that. 
It's the story of a crow. What the crow thinks of all of us who are in this planet. And so many people have asked me, what did you write about? Well, I wrote a lot of things. The only uh, result I can tell you to say that the book is a worthy book is they gave me the State Literary Award for that in 2019. And this is about a crow that is born in a little nest in a jacaranda tree, and his name is Kakian. Of course, his family is, he's got two other siblings. There's Rodney Crow and there's Lucille Crow. And of course, the mother of these three are called Alice Crow or Mama Alice. And their father is Stanley Crow. So this whole story is about this jacaranda tree and where the cronies are and what they do and what they see. So the, they had only one, really one enemy in the entire world. That was, that was the people who were downstairs, us, the human beings. So they used to call us the great one. The great ones who do, who think they are great. So all the story is revolving around these great ones, their viciousness, the way they treat each other, where they fight with each other, whereas the rest of the world, starting from birds, fish, animals, reptiles, anyone, has never done anything to harm the world except us, the great ones. So that is to talk about the great ones. And there are various characters in this book. And all these characters have different roles. So I will start off now by asking my wife to do the first reading, a small reading about a monkey called Tony Monkey, where these three cacos, that's what they, in the book, the crows call themselves cacos. When they were flying, they met this monkey. And that is the story of the monkey my wife is going to read. Thank you. Here is, her name is Bill. And staying on the ground were not wise ways to go about life. That's something the seniors grilled into us young cacos when they taught us about life. Rodney and I flew around the shop compound while Lucy laid, just to see what this place was like. It was really just a shop and nothing much else. And the people there were a little different from the great ones we knew. A clan of the great ones whom they called poor. Now that is something we Kakos can never understand. This poor and rich business. Among us, we are all the same. No Kako is rich and no Kako is poor. We all have a place to call home and we all have our families and we all eat and enjoy life in the same way. We were well organized from the time we came to this planet. Not only we, but all the animals and the birds and the fish and the reptiles followed the same system. It's only the great ones who are different. They have no idea of equality. We have plenty of it. They fight and struggle to be better than the others. I think that must be how this poor and rich thing came about. Poor shops and rich shops, poor people and rich people, everything they do divided by this line which no other creature on the planet knows or cares about. Rich and poor, man, that is some division. Anyway, we stayed a while and rested and said hello to a monkey who was sitting on a box with a chain around his waist. There was a horizontal pole fixed at two ends and the monkey's chain was attached to this with a metal loop which allowed him to move up and down the pole and extend himself to the length of the chain. That was the extent of his pearl, the length of the pole plus the chain added together. It wasn't difficult to figure out who was responsible for arranging that. He said hello too. He told us his name was Tony and he asked where we were going. You are just, we are just flying around to see the world. I told him, you are lucky, my friend, Tony Monkey said. I don't want to see the world. 
but I would be very happy if I could only reach those trees that grow tall there. He pointed to a line of huge trees that stood on the river bank. I've been tied here as long as I can remember. From the time I was a very little monkey swinging around in those same trees up there. His voice was very sad. I fell, you see, they caught me and they've kept me tied up from that day on. Now, that's just about the Tony Monkey story. This too long a time. Okay. Now, let me tell you some of the characters who are in this book. Now, there is a Roy Crow. Now, Roy Crow in that condominium, in the sense, the Karanda tree, was an old crow who had a broken wing. And he's the one who taught every little crow child to fly. Now, that was a big thing. And I remember my own young days as a pilot, how some people taught me, and there was a Roy there. So I wrote that character onto this crow. And he, the Roy crow had seen the whole world. That is how he became the expert on flying. And all the little ones went and then learned to fly from him. And he told them about the things that are beyond the towns and beyond the hills and how beautiful the world was because he's seen them all. So that was one character in the book called Roy Crow. And there was another crow called Victor Crow and he was called the train crow because he never wanted to stay in a tree full of crows. He lived in a railway station. Even if you go today to a railway station, you can see some crows hanging around there. Now, Victor wanted to be in the railway station because he loved trains. He told the little crows, you know that I can even drive these things. Of course, the children knew he couldn't drive, but they didn't, want, they didn't have the heart to tell him that he's lying to them. And one day, the train crow invited the children to go for a ride with them. And he said, get your permission from your mama and then I will take you and show you what the world is. And that journey was all about explaining how beautiful the world is to the little crows. Because they were growing up in a town and there was their tree was in a town. Later only they realized how beautiful the outside is. And the train crow explained to them how the great ones came, changed everything cut the trees, made cities, concrete jungles, and changed the entire atmosphere that we live in. So that was another character. Then also these crows met a very wonderful friend in a big crocodile. He was called Croco Martin. And he never bothered anybody. He just lay in the land. And he was, when he got tired, he went under the water. That's what he did. But what happened to him was even sadder because one day he was caught and taken. And somebody said that they are going to put him in a zoo, in a little square. Then somebody else, no, he's lucky if he does that. They do that. They might kill him and skin him and make shoes of his skin. That was how vicious the great ones were against innocent reptiles that were just lying by the river. So I... Now go back to the second reading. My wife would come with that about Cameron Crow. Sir, uh, excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry to intervene. Uh, could we first listen to the chair and his views and then get back if our time allows to yes. the piece you are going to read? That would do? Yes. Fine. Yeah, yeah. Piece, what you're going to read now. What did you, what did you say? I'm sorry, we couldn't follow. Ah, yes, I'll repeat. Uh, I just said, uh, uh, could we uh, uh, go on uh, to listen to uh, our chair of the station? He is yet to speak and share his views. And yes. if our oh, yeah. uh, time yeah. allows, we will get back to you again to That's listen fine. to the piece that you are going to read. Krishna, I think he still has two or three minutes. Uh, I would like to interrupt him if you permit me. No, no, we I can go back to him. After. You please, sir. Go ahead, sir. D. You, you first, me... please share your views. All then, right. if time allows, we can go back. No problem. Uh, thank you very much, Krishnaji. I'm sorry that we had to interrupt the very nice reading. 
by Jayavardhaneji uh, before this, and I do hope that he will be able to complete his reading after I leave. Uh, may I begin by complimenting uh, Ajit Kaurji, first of all, for doing this uh, festival of letters despite the pandemic, and Sahitya Academy for supporting her in this endeavor, in, the, in this very laudable uh, endeavor. And I think more than that, uh, Aparna, her very lovable and very affectionate daughter, who has supported Ajitji at all turns of life on all her ventures. Without her, I don't think this would have been possible. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to basically talk not about anything that I wrote. I'm writing my journey from Nayabhat to New Delhi. But I thought uh, since I was DG ICCR, there as a foreign service officer and as a DG ICCR, my main task was to really develop the kind of a cultural dialogue between India and the other countries. So I thought I will, I will talk a little about really what made me believe in culture as the most effective means of dialogue. And South Asia, where, uh, which is actually the basis for the festival, South Asia, one thing that we share is common to all of us is really culture. And culture, when I mean, is not just you know, writings, dancing, music. But the daily way of living, rituals, the metaphors we use in the literature, is so common to us. It's so easy for, for us to understand. And my firm belief is that if we were to basically use culture as a way of communication, dialogue between the countries in South Asia, uh, probably the politics between us would be less, that much less humongous, if it could be. Uh, so to begin with, uh, when I became DG ICCR and, and even before that, you know, we used to talk about the Ganga Jamun, Ganga Jamuni Tehzeeb of India, the, the eclectic culture which is influence of all different kinds of mainstreams, Persia, Arabic, this and that and all those things. Uh, but I those would have really remained merely words for me unless I uh, was actually born out of those kind of experiences and which became part of my life as I grew up from my childhood. I was born in one small Kucha in Old Delhi area. Uh, that Kucha was at the junction of Nayabas and uh, Lal Kuma, which Lal Kuma is the mostly Muslim predominated area Nayabans is the business area. And therefore, as we grew up, we found this kind of distinction between the different kinds of religions, cultural strands, and yet they intersected with each other so often that it became difficult for a common person, not just me, for a common person to distinguish where one began and the other ended or where they became different from each other. They somehow came together in a kind of a way that we were living the same kind of all the same kind of culture, the same kind of ideas in our daily lives, knowing each other, knowing very well that so-and-so is so-and-so religion, I'm so-and-so religion, but that made no difference in our common way of living. Uh, and therefore, I thought the best way to really explain that would be anecdotal rather than giving a long speech. One of the, I think the most eloquent anecdote that comes to my mind is that my sister, uh, her school friend, who happened to be a Muslim, came home one day. Now my mother, she was absolutely rigorously jenny kind of food, not even garlic or onions in the food, etc. And suddenly when this friend came, she knew that as a Muslim, she would be eating uh, mutton and meat, etc., etc. So her one thought was that my sisters, my daughter's friend has come, she's like my daughter. At the same time, I don't even eat onion and garlic. She eats everything, so how do I deal with this situation? So she told her, Betty, you are like my daughter, but you eat so-and-so, we don't eat, and therefore we have reservations in terms of 
what we can offer you and how we do it therefore like my family this is your tea ka this is your cup this is your saucer these are the utensils please make yourself a cup of tea feel at home but uh, do do have the do have tea with us and that girl did not mind at all she did not think that my mother was trying to basically be different from her she knew that they were different but they were trying to co live if you uh, if you could uh, use that word she made that tea she enjoyed it and every time she came afterwards she would come screaming uh, auntie where is my cup where is my saucer where is my utensil i want to have a cup of tea so that was the kind of a way we were able to live together and we were able to you know basically be different and yet be together and re- remain same uh we my school was on the terrace of not the terrace of a mosque my school was close to fatehpuri mosque and as you know those days the corporation schools uh we used to sit on the floor those uh tart etc etc the no desk nothing and the terrace joined the terrace of the fatehpuri mosque and every day while we are studying uh, we are reading etc etc we used to watch people coming into the mosque doing wuzu and offering prayers so we knew that there is a different way in which they do things at the same time when we came down from the school we met the same people doing the same thing that we were doing in terms of business in terms of eating in terms of moving around so different and yet one so that again became a part of my habit to know how things are coming together despite being really different and that slowly became the part of the cultural personal that i began that, that that i became that maintain distinctions maintain the identities but let us not build those walls between the identities let those identities not become so totally isolated from each other that we are not able to talk to each other the identities prosper when we talk to each other they die when there is nothing to feed them and they remain basically within their own four walls and there is nothing more to sustain them or to make them grow so that is what i learned as we grow uh, as i grew in that kind of environment i remember i i was told this so often uh that as 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 an example of how the communities were together and you remember that if you have been to chandni chowk and i'm sure that all of you have been to old delhi area when you go to chandni chowk you see gurudwara sees ganj and facing gurudwara sees ganj is saint jeb church less than half a kilometer away is the jama masjid less than half a kilometer away is the fatehpuri masjid you have jain temple gauri shankar temple within about 200 meters and as we grew as i grew i used to walk along chandni chowk the streets in balli maran i began to enjoy the history of those places which was so intermixed and my neighbors whenever we talk to each other they would be we were sitting in a kind of you know the chapal and they would tell us what all these havelis have been all about history of the havelis we would we would be told how galib used to live in this house and create his poetry there we were told how the other uh pandit ji was living just beside their house and he was basically creating other things so there was this kind of an intermixing uh one great example that i was told about this is really and which which became again a very indelible part of my own thinking process uh one of the most famous ram leelas and incidentally ram leelas was supported a great deal by different communities the dresses were made by the muslims the flowers came from the uh, hindu shops jainis made something else the people who sold different things for from all different communities the ramlila maidan was one of the most famous and the biggest on the day of the bharat milan bharat mila two chariots would start from ramlila ground one chariot of ram would pass from ramlila maidan go through chabri bazar kazi hod and come through nai sadak to town hall the other chariot of bharat would come via red fort delegate raj red fort 
and on the Chandni Chowk and come to the town hall. The chariot which carried, which was a, a vehicle for Ram, passing through Sita Ram Bazaar, all Muslims, all Hindus showered petals on the Ram Chandra. Ram Chandra was so much of an icon of our own society that he was not thought of as a Hindu god or a Muslim god or what. Hindu Ram was part of our own society, our own cultural fabric to be to, to be a guide to how we should be living, to be a guide to our own moral character. Moharram procession, I remember, I used to see that very often. While Shias would be actually going along, usual beating themselves, etc., etc., uh, flag flagrating themselves, Hindu Akharas used to be part of those processions. And they would be actually supporting all those things. So as I grew along, and when I mean, these became part of my own thinking that in a sense that our cultural values are essentially an integration, a synthesis of what we have imbibed in terms of values over thousands, two thousands of years, beginning from Vedas. Uh, Rig Veda was mentioned here, Dhyan. Rig Veda has mentioned excellent traditions of what we have been, but the Vedas also teach us that our learning comes through not just rot or discourse. We have to understand. It comes through talking to the teacher. The Gurukul became essential because the pupils could have a dialogue with the Guru. They could question. They could debate the issues. And debate was not, not or the dissent, if you didn't agree with the teacher, that was not banned. It was not frowned upon provided it was not just an idle or useless kind of a debate, provided it was an informed discussion. So that was actually encouraged even from the Vedic tank. So that became part of me when I became DZ ICCR. And then as I began to see how our own cultural traditions have come about, it became simpler for me to use that culture as a way of dialogue with the other countries, doing conferences, doing uh, when I did the jazz festival, when we did the South Asian festival, uh, cultural festival, when we did the dialogue between Kavali and uh, Darveshis and our Bhakti Sangeet, Bhajans, all that became so vibrant. So essentially, I thought that I will just basically mention the way I have evolved as a cultural personnel because of my upbringing, because of my growth in the area which perhaps to my mind is the crucible, is the essence of what India is all about. Thank you very much. I have finished. I hope I didn't exceed my 12 minutes. No, no, no. no. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks a lot for your wonderful talk. Yeah, Ajit Ma'am wanted to share. Yeah. You can go on. You can go on. Ajit, I, we can go on, but I will... I will then we will have a bilateral dialogue. Thank you very much. I will come to your home. Thank you. Fine. Thank I'm you. happy to announce that um, Dr. K. Srinivas Raoji, Secretary of Sahitya Academy, is also here on screen with us. Now, uh, I think this is time to end. Uh, while ending this session, I heartily thank on behalf of Sahitya Academy and Foundation of Sark Writers and Literature uh, to all the participants, Goel sir, Dr. Paudial, Zuariza Ma'am, Captain Elmo Jaiwardhane, Dr. K. Srinivas Raoji, and uh, Ajit Kormai. The session ends here. Yeah. Ajit, 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 do you want yeah. to say something? Yeah, 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 madam. Elmo has to be given five minutes. Fine, okay. Captain Elmo, sir, please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself, Elmo, sir. Yeah, yes, it's done. Yes. Thank you very yeah. much. I, I really uh, am very 
appreciative of what that lady said to give me five minutes, but I think I lost the uh, whole line. But uh, I just wanted to tell you I was very, very I was very uh, grateful to the people who organized this event for inviting me because I met a lot of new faces here, heard a lot of things about literature, and I only hope the pandemic will go off and we will one day be able to sit across the table and talk literature, which is a wonderful thing for me to look forward to. And I, for one, would definitely come anywhere it is held. So please accept my heartfelt gratitude for the invitation you extended to me. And I hope that all will be well for you and literature will grow and the pandemic will vanish away. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. The session ends here. Thanks a lot, all of you.